bycatch reduction technology for commercial fisheries. Um, and our candidate here is uh, Brett Favaro behind the podium and uh, the examining committee uh, is com comprised of, uh, let's see, let's get this in the right order, senior supervisor, <coughs> Dr. Isabel uh, Conte, uh, supervisor, uh, Dr. John Reynolds, supervisor, um, uh, Stephanie Duff, uh, uh, internal examiner, Dr. Larry Dill, and our esteemed external examiner, Dr. Selena Heppo from Oregon State University. So uh, the way this uh, thesis defense will basically unfold is first we'll have a presentation by uh, Brett for somewhere in the range of around 30 to 45 minutes, as sort of typical of, of these sort of presentations. And then after that, we will have uh, questioning by the committee um, on various different aspects of his thesis, and perhaps a second round of questions if uh, the committee members would like to follow up uh, their, after their initial round of questions. And at that point, we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience, if there are any. And following that, we'll ask everyone to, except for the committee, to withdraw to uh, uh, assess uh, the results of the defense. So I think that that pretty much gets us ready to get going. So without further ado, I guess I give you Brett. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk to you all today about the issue of trade-offs in ecology and conservation. Nowhere is this issue more profound than in commercial fishing. So commercial fishing is all about the process by which we go out and we pull organisms from the water for our own use. And we're always trying to balance the need to do that with the need to leave things in there to ensure sustainability. Now, it wasn't always like this. For most of history, we had trouble getting things out of the water in the first place, and the goal was always to find a way to increase the amount that we catch from the water, basically per unit effort that we put into it. We're not well adapted to take fish out of the water. It's all to do with our, our ability to do so is entirely dependent on the technology that we use. Now, over time, our technology got a lot better, and we reached the point where we could very easily pull out large volumes of sea life at very little, uh, at very little effort put into it. Now, predictably, as population increased, this caused the problem. This graph simply shows the global production of seafood. And what we see is from 1950 until today, it increased and increased until it flattened out in the 90s. And this is very much an example of how our technology, we can get better and better at fishing, but at some point we have to consider managing what, we what we're taking out of the water. Now, the aspect of fishing I'm going to focus on today is bycatch. And this essentially is what happens when you go fishing and you catch something other than what you're intending to catch. This is a shark caught in a net. It affects all sorts of different groups. It, is, it affects seabirds, turtles, fish, sometimes invertebrates. And it accounts for between 8 to 40% of marine catch. This wide range of estimates is because you can define bycatch in a lot of different ways. But for our purposes here, it's, what you're, it's catch that is not what you were intending to catch when you went fishing. Now, bycatch can be the primary driver of population declines, but it can cause all kinds of other problems, too. It can make your fishery less profitable by increasing your sort times. It can damage your gear. It can cause your, your fishery to have to close early because perhaps it's mixed in with a stock that is a little bit more robust and your bycatch stock can't, can't sustain that type of mortality. So it becomes an issue in that regard as well. Now the way that we deal with bycatch in marine fisheries is th th there's, a, there's many ways. Some of them are more extreme, like chasing after tuna fishing boats with, with uh, zodiacs. But a lot are, many more main, are much more mainstream. 
And they divide into two broad categories. You can fish less or you can fish smarter. Fishing less, and this is by no means exhaustive, but fishing less can include closing areas that are very high in bycatch. It can include simply reducing your fleet-wide fishing effort, so you just catch less overall. Fishing smarter can, can involve banning discards. So perhaps you, you make it so people can't throw things back in the water. Instead, they have to land everything they catch and use it and sell it, and they develop markets for these species. You could use tradable quotas. So perhaps you turn your single species fishery into a multi-species fishery, and people just trade how much they're allowed to catch. So if somebody catches a lot of bycatch over here, they buy quota off someone else so that the fishery doesn't have to close. Or you can improve the selectivity of your fishing gear. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. Bycatch reduction devices are essentially any type of modification that you do to your fishing gear that specifically is focused on reducing bycatch. These devices are incredibly broad, and these are just a handful of images from different types of fishing gear, different fisheries around the world, where people have come up with these modifications to keep the non-target species away from their fishing gear, or to facilitate them escaping. A meta-analysis in 2005 revealed that if the results that people were getting in their experimental trials could be matched in commercial fisheries, the, the worldwide usage of bycatch reduction devices, or BRDs, could reduce our global bycatch by 25 to 64%. So that it seems very promising. And it's interesting because in ecology, most of what we do when we're talking about conservation is restricting activity. Whereas this is something where we're coming up with something new that enables us to keep doing our activity while doing less harm. So in my thesis, I evaluate bycatch reduction devices. And I follow this broad framework, which is going to be coming up again and again throughout my talk. You have to answer three main questions. First of all, how does your bycatch reduction device change your bycatch? Second of all, how does it change your catch of target species? Third, is it practical for use in a commercial fishery? And we'll, we'll explore these in our two case studies that we examine. So these three questions determine if your bycatch reduction device will meet your management objectives. And so my talk is going to be divided into two parts. First of all, a global scale meta-analysis, where we ask the question, do BRDs in longline fisheries reduce the capture of sharks and rays? Secondly, we zoom in on British Columbia in a local but still large-scale fishery, and we look at creating and testing a bycatch reduction device for use in the BC spot on trap fishery. Let's start with sharks and rays. Nearly a third of cartilaginous fish species have been classified by the IUCN as threatened or near-threatened, and the primary driver of these declines is due to overfishing. Millions of sharks and rays are taken as bycatch, so it's not all targeted, and this problem is particularly acute in longline fisheries. Now, long lines look like this. You have a main branch line that's suspended by floats, and they can extend for kilometers. Attached to the main branch line are small leaders, and these leaders at the end of them have a little hook, and on the hook is a bait. And the problem is that you're targeting large-bodied, in the case of pelagic long lines anyway, large-bodied pelagic fishes that like to eat the same things that sharks like to eat. And so you end up with this situation where you're catching sharks as bycatch quite frequently. No one really knows exactly how many sharks have been captured in longline fisheries specifically due to bycatch, but there have been a lot of case studies which suggest that in aggregate it could be in the millions. And so the question that I asked is, has anyone come up with a way, is there a type of bycatch reduction device which effectively reduces this shark and ray bycatch across contexts, across species, and across fisheries? So to answer this question, I did what's called a meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is simply this. You, take all the you do a, a literature search, and you take all the literature on a specific topic, and you aggregate it all together, and you compute a statistical effect size for each paper. And what the effect size is, is it's simply a statistical measure of the magnitude and direction of the effect that you observe in response to a treatment. In this case, the treatment being the application of a bycatch reduction device. You're always going to have a dot that's your effect size, and a bar which is your 95% confidence interval. And if the bar spans the line in the middle, it goes across it, it means it's not statistically significant. We had some specific criteria for including studies into our meta-analysis. First of all, the studies had to be done in the field, not in an aquarium, because many studies are just done in lab conditions. So I wanted to focus on things that had actually been tested in the field. Second of all, they have to use actual fishing gear. So we can't just use an experimental apparatus in the field. I want to see actual hooks without a device and hooks with a device. And that's the final point, is that you have to be doing this direct comparison between equipped hooks and BRD unequipped hooks, so standard hooks. We found a total of 27 publications. And within these publications, there were 24 independent studies. So sometimes a publication 
would have more than one separate study that would be described. So we've computed effect size for each study. And the rest of the information I'm going to show you fits onto this graph. Now before I start populating this graph, I'll explain what's going on here. So we use an effect size called the relative risk. And what this essentially means, if you have a relative risk of two, it means you're twice as likely to catch a shark or ray or a target species. You'll see, you'll see how these dots work. But you're, you're twice as likely to catch it in your bycatch reduction device equipped gear as you are in standard gear. If you have a relative risk of 0.5, it means you're half as likely to catch it. And again, if the confidence intervals span this bar, it means it's not statistically significant. So we're going to start, oh yeah, so what we want to see is we want to see shark and ray, those dots will be in black. We want to see those over here. So we want to see that these gears are reducing the bycatch. For our Telios fishes, or our target catch, we want to see the dot to the right or in the middle. So we want to see that it's either increasing or not changing our overall catch. So this would be a, a good category of, of BRD. And we'll start with the overall model. So if you just, don't worry about what type of BRD is being used, just in general. If a BRD is used in a fishery, what do we get? So the black dot shows a relative risk of about 0.85, but it's a non-significant effect. For target catch, it's a little bit higher, so a relative risk of about 0.9. So again, that's below that one line, but it's not statistically significant. Now before I move on, there's about 5.5 million hooks worth of data that go into these dots. So this is the power of meta-analysis, is you bring together a staggering amount of data to come up with these, with these conclusions. So it's, it's very, very interesting. So I'll walk you all through the different types of devices we encountered now. Circle hooks and appendage hooks. So a standard long line fishery uses a J hook. These circle hooks and appendage hooks are designed, the circle hooks are meant so that it's harder for the animal to bite down onto the hook. And it also promotes hooking in the jaw. And I'll expand more on that later. It's better than being hooked in the gut. So it promotes survival as well. Appendage hooks are a circle hook, but they also have a little attachment that again increases, further increases the difficulty for the animal to bite down onto it. And what we see with both of these is, again, all non-significant effects on catch. Next, we have an interesting class of bycatch reduction device, which are electromagnetic. So some of them, the electropositive gears generate an electric field while these devices are in the water. Magnets are, generate a magnetic field. And the way that it works with the electropositives is that the metal actually dissolves. And while it's dissolving, it produces an electric field. The magnets don't dissolve, but they just generate a magnetic field. And then some people have combined electromagnetics and magnets into the same into the same hook. All non-significant findings. Bait color. So sometimes people have tried to dye the bait blue, the idea being that it's harder for the sharks to see the bait. Um, what's interesting about this is after these studies came out, somebody did a study that found that a lot of sharks are probably colorblind. So that ex probably explains why this was a non-significant effect. Another category, monofilament and multifilament nylon leaders. So a standard leader is a wire coming from the main branch line, from the main line to the little hook. Usually it's wire. The problem with that is a shark bites it and then they're stuck on it and they end up dying on the hook. The idea with these is, with the monofilament nylon, is that they can bite it off and swim away. Multifilament nylon is meant to be a little bit thicker so they can see that and that should dissuade them from biting the hook. And what we see are non-significant effects here. We see actually a significant reduction only in target fish catch with the multifilament nylon. And then finally, one extra category, if you have a demersal long line, so a long line on the bottom, Sometimes people put, uh, this device is putting floats on the hook, so it floats them up off the bottom, which should reduce the number of times that the shark species interact with it in that fishery. Okay, we're going to unpack some of these a little bit. So first of all, the number of studies in each category. I've got them now on, on the right there, and E means elasmobranch, so shark and ray. T is for target, teleos catch. First of all, you'll note that there's many fewer studies that reported target catch than there were that reported shark catch. And this is very problematic when you, re when you remember that you have to assess your target catch as well as your bycatch in order to determine if these devices are effective. Secondly, a lot of categories of gear actually have very few studies that look at how effective they were. So there's you know, potential for some of these, perhaps with additional research, perhaps the confidence intervals would narrow and we would get a better sense of what they're doing. But I'm going to go into detail on the third category now, practicality for use in the fishery, starting with the electropositive and magnetic gear. Now what's interesting about these gears is that every time someone does a study on this, there tends to be a lot of media attention. You see BBC, we've got Smithsonian.com, and Science News, and they always seem to say, at least for the media reports, they highlight how exciting and potentially effective these gears are. They even tested them on Mythbusters in an episode. So there's a lot of publicity along these, along these gears. But when you unpack it and you look into what they do in commercial fisheries, so this, this shows your electropositive gear. Remember I said they have to dissolve when they're in the water? 
This graph along the x-axis is time, and this bar just shows the electric field produced by one of these devices. And you see that after only a couple days in the water, they actually stop producing an electric field. Now this is a problem if you have 10,000 hooks on your line. You're now having to change this device every single time or every couple times you put this in the water. So that's potentially a big problem. In terms of magnetics, these things cost now about $300 per kilo. So they're very, very expensive. And again, when you're scaling up to the level of the fishery, that's going to be a lot of uh, magnets that you have to buy to outfit your gear. Also, magnets stick together. And if you're thinking about being on a long line boat where you've got big vats or whatever of hooks and you're trying to get these hooks ready to go on your line, you're going to have to be pulling these things apart. And this is a big problem, potentially a big problem. Finally, electropositive metals explode. So when you're machining them, you know, it produces sparks and whatnot, and you can get these big fires. And this is a, this is a serious thing that's being reported in these papers, that you have to account for this when you're machining these. So it drives your costs way, way up in terms of safety. Another point I want to make in terms of trade-offs. Even if these save the sharks, you're now introducing something in the water that dissolves, and we know that they're kind of toxic when they dissolve into the water. And the mining process for rare earth metals is very toxic as well. So you're trading off potential effects on sharks for effects on the ecosystems where they pull this metal out of the earth in the first place. So it's, it's something to keep in mind when you're looking at these, at these I issues. Is they're not constrained to the issue itself. Let's unpack monofilament nylon leaders and end on a bit more of a positive note for this section. Nylon leaders are promising, but there's only been one study that's looked at them. However, the way that these work is the, the sharks go and bite them off and swim away, so it seems like a pretty, good, a pretty good plan. The problem is that those hooks are now in the shark, and so when they swim around, there's been some documented effects. Even though these hooks might be in the jaw of the shark and not the gut, you can still get infections at the point of, of uh, puncture, and so this is something that has to be looked at a little bit more to understand what the consequences of that could be. One more, circle hooks and appendage hooks. So I don't want to write these off. Just because they don't keep the sharks off the hooks, they're very good at keeping sea turtles off of the hooks. And they're also very good at promoting, as I said earlier, jaw hooking, as opposed to being hooked in the gut of the animal. So there's, there's all these other sort of aspects to this that are not necessarily captured in a simple measure of whether you're catching or not catching the animal. To conclude this section, we found that most bycatch reduction devices do not reduce elasmobranch bycatch. Furthermore, we found that target catch is inadequately measured in many studies. And this really has to improve. Sec uh, thirdly, electromagnetic bycatch reduction devices are impractical. And I argue that their, their problems are inherent to the design of the gear itself. An electropositive device has to dissolve. That's how it generates its field. You can't just design around this. Magnets have to stick together. That's what they do. So I'm going to make the controversial recommendation of actually not throwing more research at this potential topic. I think there might be other more promising ways to solve this problem. Finally, at this point, there's no silver bullet for reducing shark and reef bycatch, at least through gear modification alone. Let's change scales here and talk about the BC spot prawn trap fishery. So this is a spot prawn. It's a delicacy here, and right now, actually, the fishery just opened here in BC, and you can buy these down at the dock. They're a very interesting animal, because usually when people associate prawns and shrimp, uh, when they think about the conservation status of, of these fisheries, you hear about the trawling and farming and all these issues that create massive ecological destruction. But this fishery employs traps. You can't really see it on this image, but you can certainly see it here. It uses trapping gear to catch the prawns as opposed to trawls or, fit or farming. This gear has resulted in this fishery being endorsed by Sea Choice and OceanWise as being a sustainable gear because it produces low habitat destruction and the idea is also it produces low bycatch by weight. Some more facts about it. This fishery is worth between 20 to $45 million annually. It's active between May and June, usually for about 60 days. And it's managed to a target catch per trap. So you don't get a quota for prawns. You can keep fishing until there's a, so, so at the beginning of the fishery, there'll be lots of prawns in your trap. And as the fishery progresses, the stock will be depleted until the point where there's a small number of prawns per trap. At some point, they cut it off and the fishery closes. This will be important later on. There's about 200 boats in the fleet, each boat with three to 500 traps. And the, there's a mean effort annually of about 3.4 million trap deployments per year, which is a very, very high effort in a relatively constrained area in a, in a very short time. So it's, it's very interesting in that regard. Now, while these traps are thought to be pretty sustainable, they do have one problem, and that's that they catch rockfish as bycatch. Rockfish are a group of about 65 species that live in the Pacific coast of North America, and they share habitat with spot prawns. Most species are ground fish, so they live in pretty deep water. Prawn traps are down about 100 meters, and a lot of rockfish live down there as well. And the problem is when you pull a rockfish up to the surface as bycatch, 
its swim bladder explodes, its eyes pop out of its head, and its discard survival is thought to be very, very low as a result. We care about rockfish because their populations are depleted due to overfishing. They're very long-lived. The oldest one that's been seen is uh, estimated at the age of 205 years. And as with any species with a long lifespan, it means they have, have a late age of sexual maturity. Recruitment is highly variable, and we still don't fully understand what results in a good year or a bad year for rockfish stocks. And we have this interesting problem where fecundity and larval quality increase with maternal age. So those big old rockfish that we like to eat when we target are also the ones that are best equipped to um, populate the next generations of rockfish. Another layer to this story is the rockfish conservation area. So as a result of this depletion, Department of Fisheries and Oceans instituted this policy where they would put aside everything in this map that's red. These are all rockfish conservation areas. And these are called, these are essentially partial closure areas where you're not allowed to do certain things that are thought to harm rockfish. And the quote in the book says, within RCAs, inshore rockfish are protected from all mortality associated with recreational and commercial fisheries. Now within these areas, you are allowed to fish for prawns. And so this was something that caused the prawn fishery several years ago, before I started in 2008, to start to try and approach people to figure out how they can tackle this bycatch problem before somebody gets concerned about them potentially not being able to fish in these areas. Now I'll note that there's several other things you can do in these areas as well, um, including trawling for ground fish. <laughs> so let's look at the, the extent of the problem in the fishery. So before we go much further, one of the first things that, that I actually did when I approached this was ask the question, how extensive is this problem in the fishery? And so we used fishery independent data collected by DFO and found that there's between three to 39 rockfish per thousand traps that are deployed and then that trajectory been upward over time. This in companion with another paper that was published where they looked at data collected within the fishery, they found one to eight rockfish per thousand traps um, coming out to a total estimate of 20 to 40,000 rockfish per year, but I note that was with only 1.5% observer coverage in the fishery. And there's extensive research to show that when observer coverage is low, you tend to underestimate your bycatch in, in fisheries. But regardless of whether this affects the whether people might consider this a population level problem, it was certainly a problem to managers because you've got this, this fleet that's fishing very intensively in these areas where it says you're not allowed to affect rockfish. So our next step was to develop and test better fishing techniques for this fishery. Now anytime you're trying to do this, you want to find the differences between target and non-target species and exploit those differences. Differences could be morphological. So for example, a sea turtle is much bigger than a shrimp, so it's very obvious that you could sort based on size could be behavioral. As a trawl net's coming, perhaps one species likes to swim up and the other one swims down. So you can make an escape panel that takes advantage of that. Could be spatial or temporal. So you simply don't fish in areas that are high, that produce high bycatch rates. Once you figure this out, you make your appropriate modifications to the fishing process and you're good to go. I want to take you on board a prawn fishing boat. So this is us approaching, that's a fishing boat right there and we're on a little zodiac going out to measure and look at the bycatch that they're experiencing on their vessel. And this is what it looks like when you're fishing for prawns. So you've got a big winch here, it's pulling up the line, and that guy's gonna take the prawn trap off the line in a second. Okay, puts it down, sorts it. Watch how quickly it deals with the bycatch. Right, that's, that's how long it takes, okay? When you set the gear, the boat runs along the surface and basically the line trails out the back of the boat. And you stand there, this is the most dangerous thing on the boat. So you know, there's a line whipping down the middle of the vessel right now. So this is where I was always trying to stay out of the way, right? Because it can loop around your neck or whatever. It's not good. So he's standing there, he's gonna clip a trap to the main line, and he's just gonna push it off the back of the boat. You'll see it right there, there it drops. So I'll move on. There's some constraints too though, if we're gonna build a BRD for this fishery, the devices have to be durable. We can't have them falling apart every deployment or nobody's gonna to wanna to use them. They can't really change the fishing process, so you want to have minimal training for the fishers so that they are using these properly. And you don't want to have a very high implementation cost either. So you don't want them to have to potentially rebuy all their traps if you can avoid it. So we'll take you through a prawn trap so you get an idea of what you have to work with when you're approaching this problem. So this is a prawn trap here, okay? It's pretty light, and it's very simple. There's only four parts. There's a frame, there's an opening that's three inches in diameter, 7.6 centimeters. You've got a bait can in the middle, and basically you've got your, your strap here which is used to close or open the trap. So there's not, not a lot of parts to work with on this. When they're underwater, they sit down like that, and you've basically got a long line that goes along the bottom with a buoy at both ends, and there's anchors and whatnot that connect them. And so I'll show you what I came up with. So first of all, the simplest thing to change on the trap is just to change the size of the opening. 
So we started by just changing the opening diameter and making it a little bit smaller, okay, in, in two steps. So we go uh, from 7.6 to 7.0 diameter to 6.4 centimeter diameter, which corresponds to the quarter of an inch decrease each time. But we also came up with these tunnel-based devices, which I'll get out for the committee here. I'll let you guys <laughs> play with these. So these devices essentially are just a ladder-type device where the prawns can crawl in, but the rockfish hopefully can't make the bend. And I'll show you a video that explains my, my rationale. So here's the spot prawn. And watch how, see its tail can, can flip this way, right? And the idea being, you simply clip this to the inside of the trap like so, right? You just strap it right to the opening, so it doesn't increase the footprint. This is what prawns look like when they're going into traps. So see how they're, they're crawling up the mesh like a ladder, right? They're, they're crawling up it, and they come in, they're coming into the opening right now, and they flip over and drop down. So you can imagine if there's one of these on there, they should theoretically be able to make that, that bend. By contrast, rockfish just gently undulate their tail from side to side. They swim along like that. And I imagined, again, that it would have trouble completing this bend. So we made these out of two materials. These are PVC pipes that we tried making these out of at first, but they turned out to be very non-durable and they fell apart, so we had to go to the more expensive stainless steel devices. And these were all used in, in our uh, field trial and we didn't take very good care of them, so they're, they're quite durable. They don't increase the profile of the trap at all, so this one's equipped with it. It looks just like a normal trap. And so we took them into the field and we simply put in the gear into the water and went fishing with it. We collected all the catch that, was, that we brought up in the traps and we measured it and we identified the species to see what the condition was as well as the catch that we were getting. So we ended up deploying a total of 1,362 traps nested within 10 trap strings. And they were deployed all throughout the southern Gulf Islands and through House Sound. So every black dot there is a string of 10 traps. And by nesting them on 10 trap strings, you can account for the spatial variability of fishing because you've got all the different gears on each string and you, 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 can, you can deal with it that way. So our results were as follows. First of all, the question, how do the BRDs affect bycatch? Well, aggregating together all the, t the ring-based devices, so this control and the slightly smaller ones, we caught a total of six rockfish and 723 traps, corresponding to a rate of 0 0.008 rockfish per trap. Now remember that the commercial rate is 0 0.003 to 0 0.039, so that's about comparable. In the tunnel-based devices, we caught no rockfish. Now that's good, that's what we wanted, but it's not entirely convincing because you're dealing with such small numbers of fish. So our next step was to look at all the fish that we caught in the traps and see what happened with those. And what we found was essentially this. So this is just the fishing count, this is the fish catch rate per trap, right? And we've got our control, our smaller openings, and we've got our tunnel-based devices. And what we found is the only statistically significant reduction was experienced in the five and seven <coughs> ring devices. So even the four ring device, this, this, this one here is a four ring, it had to be the five or the, or the seven ring, the ones that were longer. Furthermore, we looked at the body size of fish. So usually when you think about fish size, you think about the length. But length actually isn't the limiting factor with traps. What it is is the body depth, because they're trying to fit in this little circular opening. So we measured the body depth of all the fish caught in the trap, and we found again, the only devices that experienced a reduction. So the way this works is the blue line is the mean, okay, the mean body depth. The only ones that had a statistically significant reduction were the five and seven ring bycatch reduction devices. And all this graph shows this is a distribution plotted around our data within each category. So this is good for a couple reasons. One, it means we're catching, if, if it were to be a rockfish, which it wasn't, but it would be a smaller one. But because we're getting smaller body fishes, it means we're moving to species of less conservation concern. Not to say they're unimportant, but just to say that uh, something like a black-eyed goby is going to survive the capture a lot better just by virtue of the fact that it doesn't have a swim bladder than, will a, than a rockfish. Unless it gets picked off by a dogfish or something. We actually don't know what goes on when they're discarded. So the conclusion was bycatch was reduced in the five and seven ring traps. Question two, how did these affect target catch? So this was interesting. First of all, even reducing the opening size by 0.6 of a centimeter in diameter was enough to produce quite a reduction in prawn catch. Okay. So this is, this is a very difficult thing to solve. When we went to our tunnel-based traps, they reduced catch as well. And when you aggregate across all of the tunnel traps, it was a reduction of about 40% less prawns than in the control traps. Now that sounds horrifying, but we'll get back to this a little bit later. It might, might be something that we can work around. There's also the carapace length. So, so the, the body size of the prawns, when you look at the size of the prawns being captured, um, this graph, the dotted line shows 3.3 centimeters, and that's the minimum legal size for prawns. So everything under this, they would have to discard no matter what. 
And what we see is there is a statistically significant reduction in body size in the five